Welcome to the Business Owner Elevation Podcast, the show that's designed for coaches, consultants, and expert business owners that are looking to achieve higher levels of productivity and profitability, where we share battle-tested tactics and innovative ideas that guarantee to elevate your business rapidly. Brought to you from the award-winning Best UK Business Podcast in 2015. Without further ado, here's your hosts, Robert Dean Smith and Leon Street. Hello and welcome to another edition of the SB Elevation Podcast with me, your host, Robert Dean Smith the first, and the awesome, the most talented, the most smoothest of dulcet tones from the sunny state of Wolverhampton, Mr. Leon Street in the house. Wow, Rob, you've been so gracious this morning. What is going on there? <laughs> <laughs> I've had, I've had last night's Jack Daniels, it's still wearing off. Oh, I see. So there's all the yeah, nice I, yeah, I thought something strange is going on there. Like, you're very complimentary, very complimentary. So, you know what? Today is another exciting interview. But before we get into that, we've got some real hustle coming up right about now. The IPM Vortex event, uh, sorry, IPM Business Breakthrough event is coming in September. Yeah. And it's going to take place on the 25th. 4th to the 25th of September and I'm super pumped and excited for that because we've got a real treat in store. So the the past videos are up online and we'll be posting them on the SB Elevation website for people to have a look and check it out and we may even give a bonus clip of myself and Rob doing keynotes at the last event we held in May. Mm -hmm. So I think that's real exciting for people to grab hold of that but before we talking, you know, any further about that. What I want to do is introduce and waiting in the wings to the show. We have Mr. Paul Boros. How are you doing, Paul? Very well indeed. Thanks, chaps. Very well awesome. indeed. Awesome. So, guys, you are in for a real treat. And I know this personally, and so does Rob, because yeah. we met Paul not long ago, both, both of us, as we were speaking at an event in London. And this guy knows a thing or two about presenting and communication and quite frankly i thought he was pretty awesome i don't know about you rob off the richter off the richter scale <laughs> off the richter scale funny humorous brilliant antidote storytelling yeah it, yeah it was it was awesome and it was gr you know it was great to connect with paul uh, at that event awesome Absolutely. So you know what, SB Elevation, everybody listening right now, I'm just going to run through his bio so you get a feel for what he's done, what he's about. But believe you and me, he's going to be able to help you in your business and what you do. So a communication expert, as an internationally recognized authority on communications, presentation, performance, and the art of science of persuasion, Paul regularly features on conference programs and features in articles both in print and online. Business consultant Paul has worked with major organizations such as the BBC, Google, the Financial Times, Royal Bank of Scotland, MTV, training executives from around the world of business and media in a range of presentation, communication and pitching skills. Paul has worked with luminaries such as Sir Richard Branson, Ainsley Harriet, and Sky newscaster Dermot Mahanahan. And... You know what, there's a lot more, and I'm not going to read out the whole bio, because he's sent us loads, like most of our guests normally do, and I'm going to let him talk about it more as we get into it, but yeah. there's more information on him as a business consultant, public speaker, as m myself and Rob already mentioned. He's an experienced presenter and entertainer, and to top it all off, an author. So we are in for a real treat, guys, so thanks for coming on the show, Paul. Well, thank you. After that introduction, I can't wait to hear what I've got to say. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Now, as we said, we met you a couple of weeks ago in London and you were pretty awesome, I must say. And I was actually taking notes thinking, wow, this guy really knows how to communicate and connect with an audience. And so, yeah, I do have to follow up with Paul myself so I can deep dive into this skill that he has around presenting because I know it will be useful for myself. But I want to kick off the interview, Paul, if that's OK with you. Yes, no problem at all. So here it is. What is your elevated success quote or mantra or key principles that keep you on track and headed towards success? Well, the one thing that comes to mind when I, I think of that is a quote, which is the meaning of your communication is the response you get. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean that actually you can't walk around blaming other people for your com communication. Your message is your message and how you deliver it is only really appropriate as to how other people grasp it. Mm -hmm. Now, I work with a lot of mm -hmm. CEOs around the world and I hate it when one of them says, 
do you know what? The people in accounts are so stupid. I've told them this <laughs> six times and they still don't get it. Mm. And I always say the meaning of your communication is the response you get. Because if you are not communicating in the right way, it's your responsibility. You cannot go around blaming other people. I mean, to that end, I remember when my son was five years old, you know, they do the SAT exams at that. Uh, no, he was seven years old, the SAT yeah. exams at seven years old. And his mm -hmm. teacher came up to me mm -hmm. and said, I bet you're worried about Sam's exams. And I said, no, wow. <laughs> I bet you're worried about Sam's exams. <laughs> and he said, well, what do you mean? I said, wow. well, if you're doing your job properly, he'll be fine, won't he? Mm. Because why would he be blaming me or my son? If you are a trainer, if you are a teacher, yeah. if you are there to give information to people, the meaning of your communication is the response you get. That is the core to everything. Mm. So I walk into every meeting, every lecture, every workshop I do with the idea that, you know what, it can't be their fault if they don't get it, it can only be my fault. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's actually a phrase that I use as well myself, Paul. Communication is the response mm -hmm. I get. And you've just eloquently explained that. And I love the story around your son and the teacher. And it's one of those that, you know, straight away reflect the question yeah. back to the person, let them uh -huh. think about it for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was a lot. Right, like that. You. And it's all about taking responsibility. And it, it's, it's such a true fact because um, uh, my my pet hate and love with teachers mm -hmm, and their <sighs> responses. Yes, that was excellently and eloquently put. But let's dive into your, your a little bit about your story, because as Leon alluded to, you've trained a lot of people and there's a lot off that list that he's left, I'm sure. Um, but tell us, how did your that journey start? I mean, you can go back to like your first kind of career and then how that's transitioned. Because it seems like you've done some comedy as well, Paul. So Yes. Well, Rob, I, I, I started and I studied some psychology when I was uh, younger. And then I decided to make uh, the leap into the strange world of show business. I used to have a band called Morris Minor and the Majors. We had a couple of hits with stutter rap and this is the chorus and we used to play the comedy store and work all over america and then i used to do a double act with a guy you, you might know called uh, ainsley harriet the yes. chef who happens to be my best friend so so we did a, a double act called the calypso twins mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, like was, I of course was the tall black one um, <laughs> and, and funnily enough, actually, uh, when I met you two, I thought there's another potential Calypso twin. <laughs> <laughs> Just if anybody's listening right now, yeah, Ainsley so, Harriet um, is Ainsley a and famous black chef on UK TV for anybody twins, abroad. All over the world. We had a bit of record success with a song called World's Party. But what happened is I was working with some of the top people in show business all over the world. Mm. And because they knew I had a background in psychology, some of them used to come to me for little bits of help and advice. Mm -hmm. And one day a very famous comedian came to me and said, I've completely lost my bottle. I can't, I can't do it anymore. And he mm. had acute stage fright. And I didn't really know what to do in such a quick time because he had to do a live show both live from Her Majesty's Theatre and yes. on TV. So what I did is I, I rang around a few psychologists and people I knew to find out what was the quickest mm -hmm. method of helping him. And uh, I stumbled, very luckily, onto uh, a couple of people who worked in the field of neuro-linguistic programming. Yeah. And I went to the top people and... I said to them, you know, could you sort this guy out quickly? Mm -hmm. And they said, absolutely. So he went for one session, guess what, got his mojo back and was able to do the shows. I went up to them afterwards and said, I've got to know what you're doing. 
So they said, well, you work in television and, and stuff. Would you come and film a training that we're doing <laughs> for doctors, a five-day course? And I said, yeah, that would be great. I'd love to learn it. And so I went along, and on the second day of the training, I was talking mm -hmm. to a guy and a woman there, and I said, there's a lot of similarities between NLP and comedy. You know, it's all built with outcome in mind, and, you know, you, you do state change. And they said, would you, would you like to get up in front of the doctors and talk about this tomorrow? So stupidly, I said yes. And, and it started from there. And then they said to me, do you want to come and train with us? Train the doctors, mm -hmm. because the best way to learn anything is to teach it. So I spent two and a half years training at Guy's Kings and St. Thomas's hospitals, the biggest teaching hospitals in the world, and really finding out the intricacies yeah. at the sharp end of everything from NLP to TFT to lots of other, you know, CBTs, mm -hmm. all those models, which I've brought into what I do as the bitch doctor. Mm. Wow. That's that's not the whole history. Wow. Yeah, I know. I I, I know that because there's got there's got to be a connection to what you do on stage now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is a connection. Fantastic. Mm. Paul, you you broke down some other things. So you said NL, NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming, and then CBT is that cognitive based training or something like that? Cognitive behavioral therapy. Behave. Right. Okay. Okay. Because I just wanted the audience, just in case they hadn't heard no, of that sorry. kind of term, terminology. Could you just expand on that a little bit, the cognitive behavioural training and, and how you've incorporated that now in what you're doing? Well, I mean, I don't use it very much, but sometimes with people, I mean, it's essentially it's tapping. Do you, you, have you ever heard of tapping where, where you tapping, use the yeah. meridian lines on people's bodies? And sometimes when you uh, tap certain meridian lines in certain orders, it actually sends messages to uh, the brain and helps it sort things out quickly. For instance, right. if you're tapping on one meridian line, once talking to somebody, it, it makes it much easier to overcome say, something like fear of flying. So I don't use it very much. I use, I mean, I've developed from traditional psychology to neuro-linguistic programming yep. and just incorporating CBT and in everything. But I think what, what you have to do is use every element of what you've, you've got. I mean, having come from, and you very kindly said that I, I use comedy on stage well, but sometimes the comedy is actually one of the best ways to cure people. Is right. because mm -hmm. if you get somebody to laugh at their problem, you're halfway there because mm. you've, you've initiated a state change. And state change is such a powerful mechanism for people to see something from a different angle that very often you can actually slip the learning in whilst they're not expecting it. So I think, you know, understanding, if I gave it advice to anybody, is actually go and find out about everything. Go and find out about hypnotherapy, which I've done as mm -hmm. well. And everything will help you when you're dealing with people and whether you're dealing with them from the stage or whether you're doing one-to-one -one therapy, have a lot of things in your toolbox that you can pull out and try. Because I think really the most important thing that people should know is that actually you need lots of different angles to go at a problem when you're helping people. I think it was Maslow who said that, um, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm. Do you know some therapists go, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm Freudian and I'm just going to deal with this in a Freudian capacity. Or I'm Jungian yeah. and I'm going to deal with it in a Jungian capacity. Mm -hmm. Whereas, so actually, I've got a question for So, leading on from where you left off, and, and go take us up to where you are now ways. as a speaker, presenter, and author. Okay, well, 
my brand now and and what I'm introduced as is the the pitch doctor. And essentially, I help people in the companies become more successful by improving the quality and impact of their communications. As you kindly said, I'm an author of several books, including uh, The Pitching Bible, which are all around the art and science of pitching and presenting, Mm. as well as doing lots of keynote addresses around the world, trainings Mm -hmm. for companies around the world. I also do some television. Um, I'm the team psychologist on the Sky TV show School of Hard Knocks, which is now in its ninth series. The essence, I don't know if you've seen the show, but the essence of the show is we take, we go to a different part of the country every year and we take a group of young unemployed Mm -hmm. men and turn them into a rugby team in order to use rugby as an analogy to how you can get a job, i.e. rugby teaches you teamwork. It teaches you that if you get knocked down, you have to get back up again. It teaches you communication mm-hmm. skills. And I do the show with um, two brilliant communicators, Will Greenwood, who won the World Cup in 2003 with England, and the wonderful Scott Quinnell, who captained Wales and was in the British Lions. And the three of us um, do the show together. Mm-hmm. And it's probably, we all talk about it being the most wonderful experience because we get people who really are at their lowest ebb. They come from very, very tough backgrounds. You know, we have people who've been in prison for anything up to 16 years sometimes. We have people who've been uh, attempted murder. We have people with severe drug problems. And our job is to, using rugby as as an analogy, to bring them out and hold a big jobs fair at the end of the eight weeks we work with them and get them back into employment. Mm -hmm. And... It not only gets them back into a, back into employment, but it also gives them a self of sent, a, a sense of self worth, mm. which really sort of ripples out to their family and mm. their communities, and and that's the joy yeah, of doing School of Hard Knocks. Is the ripples go on for everywhere? That's phenomenal. I like that. I, I've not I've heard of the show, but I've not watched the show. But I, I but I will now mm. call. And watch the show. And well, I, you can find it on the internet, School of Hard Knocks, Sky yeah. Television. The next series starts in September. But it's, I think you'll find it inspiring because uh, it, it's, it's a, great, a great story arc of people who really go from their lowest cool. ebb you know what the, these are some actually, massive you know, things that providing mean a for lot their families people, getting you know, great whether you're jobs in business whether and, you're and an entrepreneur an established it doesn't, it doesn't matter children. where you are elevation nation everybody listening right now there's a lot of experience that paul has behind him and it's quite clear and evident to see and so what i'd like to do is kind of deep dive more into what paul knows really and start off by Finding out what has been your biggest failure to date, Paul. And the reason why we ask this question is to pass on the lessons that you've learned to our listeners. Biggest failure. Well, something that really comes to mind is uh, when I Mm -hmm. first started working with corporations and I do a lot of corporate work. I I was doing, uh, actually, funnily enough, in Birmingham, very near you are, I was doing <laughs> NEC for yeah. association. <laughs> and I made an assumption that the CEO would have a good sense of humour and wouldn't mind me taking the Michael out of him um, and setting <laughs> him up. Yeah. And it turned out that I went on stage and I immediately, at this huge conference went for him in what I thought at the time was a a good comedic way, but actually was a a disaster because he didn't have a sense of humour. He didn't want to be humiliated Mm. in front of everybody else. And his anger sat in the front row, permeated to all the other people in the the conference. (laughs) And just made my, uh, you know, you know, sometimes... It made, I think I was on for like three hours and it was probably the longest three hours in my life Yeah. as as I tried to claw back. But, you know, 
people make their decisions about you in two to three seconds. Yeah. And if you get that wrong, it's so hard to row that back. I mean, I was just in my head fighting all the time, but it was my own fault yes. because I hadn't got rapport with the, the audience. You know, if, if you enough. need to, that's cool because we, we have other guests and we'll simply you know, edit it as we need to. Paul, so can go we for share it. On, uh, can we uh, not share, but we are sharing. Can we swear on this podcast? Go for it. Well, no, it's a quote from uh, it's a quote from uh, the film Lock, Stock is, and Two Smoking is. Barrels, and it, it just says assumption is the mother of all fuck ups, mm. and and I think it is because I assumed something that I didn't know before I got rapport, mm -hmm. so it was a huge mess up. Mm. There, there is no such thing as failure. There is only feedback, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Whilst I can still remember the embarrassment at the time, actually, it was a good thing, because you have to fail to learn. Yeah, yeah. How do you, how do you go about that now? Do you, do you, how do you kind of find whether or not you can rib um, or take the Mickey out of? You know, what what are your potential clients going forward? Have you got some way of like figuring it out? Or do you ask do you do some investigative work beforehand to see if they got a sense of humor, Paul? Well, I, I it's a really good question because I'm trying to unpack what I'm I I do naturally in my head. I think what I'm very good at is is reading micro signals in the faces of the audience mm. and trying off something with a gentle, a gentler version of it first. And seeing how they react, right. so you know, I'll, 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 I'll play with the audience more. I'll play with the clients more. But actually, most people, once you have really good rapport, will will play and realise that it's fun um, and it's not, you know, trying to chop them down or the talk. Yeah. <clears throat> If you have enough rapport with an audience, or whether that audience is one person or 10,000 people, if you've got enough rapport with them, they will pretty much accept anything that you say. Um, but you've always got to do it with charm and proper wit. <laughs> so I always, yeah. I always make, tell people to be careful of comedy. Yeah, like, a, like a chainsaw. Comedy is probably <laughs> your, the best tool you can have but mm. also can be the most destructive <laughs> in the wrong hands. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Poor the Texas Chainsaw Massacre <laughs> for us. My experience all those years ago in Birmingham was, feels like I was holding a chainsaw to see those neck. Mm. <laughs> 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 yeah, Phenomenal. That one doesn't stick, to be honest, Phil. Paul, I've just got one question. I mean, how... When did you start doing that kind of those kind of corporate engagements and, and, and going out there? How long have you been actually doing doing uh, that sort of thing? The, cor the corporate world, and it's a very uh, funny story, Rob, actually, because the corporate world came through a really weird way. I was doing corporate stuff when I was with Morris Martin Majors and the Calypso Twins because we used to do corporate entertainment, but corporate right. training. I was, as I told you, uh, teaching doctors at Guy's Kings and St. Thomas's Hospitals. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, it was quite innovative, the way we were teaching the doctors their communication skills. And somebody from the BBC heard about it. And they said, we're doing a show on BBC Two called Speed Up, Slow Down, which is about the psychology of time management. Mm. And they asked me and one of the guys I was doing it with to come along and do a screen test. And I really wasn't interested in doing it at the time. But we found half an hour, went and did a screen test with, with the BBC. And the next thing we knew, they'd offer us, offered us a whole series at eight o'clock on, uh, on a weekday. I think it was on a Thursday evening of Speed Up, Slow Down. Mm. Now, when we were doing the series... Obviously, the BBC branded us as the time management experts. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, from nothing, I had a very sort of 
influential show that built my brand for me, my initial brand, which was time management. And so therefore, people like Google heard about it and said, you know what, we need time management for our people all over (laughs) the world. And suddenly, because people like Google were using me, other companies just came. So I'd like to tell you it was a really hard slog. But in fact, I just got very lucky. Mm. Well, let's say look under, you know, constructive so, notes. So obviously you were labouring away. And I want to flip you, the script and ask you what has been your biggest so success to date and where did that come That's a great story. From. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. Yeah. Mm. Well, the biggest success, I, I don't know, in one yeah, sense. Yeah, I did. I don't know about Travelling to space. When you were young... Did you dream of being a footballer or being yeah. this or something? Did you have anything <laughs> yeah. that you dreamed I, of doing? I always doing? wanted to be one of those first people going to Mars. <laughs> Travelling to space, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's yes, a big is. dream. <laughs> that is a big dream. I didn't know that one. Yeah, I've learned you today. Travelling to space. <laughs> oh, still time, Leon. Still time. Well, <laughs> I, after getting over wanting to be a footballer, which I, when I was about seven or eight... When I got to about 11 or 12, I wanted, I used to sit there every Thursday evening watching, I don't know if you remember the music show Mm -hmm. Top of the Pops, but it was, for people in other countries, it was the biggest music show and and it was an appointment to view in, in the UK. And I used to sit there and I used to dream of being like David Bowie and, Uh and being on Top of the Pops. My dream Mm -hmm. did come true, but it came true because Morris Minor and the Majors were Britain's answer to the Beastie Boys. (laughs) And we were more comedy than we were music. Where the Beastie Boys used to go and break up hotel rooms, we used to come behind and clean them up for. (laughs) So, So as for bigger success, I'm not sure if that is my biggest success because I've written successful books like The Pitching Bible and Pitch Up. Mm And um, and I I've you know played international conferences all over the world, including Davos and you know New York and all those, but merely because I dreamed it as a kid, I I, I feel that getting to do Top of the Pops was one of the big things for me, and it's maybe because you know it was such a dream as when I was a child, yeah, yeah, uh, doing that. Perhaps also writing the pitching Bible has given me almost as much pleasure because I've been able to actually use all the experience over the years and hone it into a book that lots of Mm -hmm. people have kindly said, you know, has helped them in their life and uh, helped them, you know, whether they were big businessmen or they were people who were new entrepreneurs just wanted to get into it or people who just wanted to understand how to present yeah. themselves better, how to pitch better. So, it, you know, it is about, you know, creating something. I, th- I think finding an outlet for your creativity, you know, everyone is creative, mm-hmm. but most people don't find that outlet, whether you're making art or music or capturing Absolutely. ideas and experiences into books uh, which is obviously one of the things I like to do, I would say to everybody, find a way to express yourself. Mm. Yep. Excellent. Lovely. I like that. I like that. You see, this is fascinating. Can you see, Leon, this, this interview is flowing so naturally because Paul's got so much storytelling ability. Everything's a story. I love it. I love it. I love these story arcs. Um, that, that's great. Thank you, Paul. What I was going to say, because this, this is interesting, we, we refer to our community as the Elevation Nation, our listeners, etc. And I just want to ask you, because obviously you're traveling constantly, doing all these kind of communication presentations. And I know that you've recently been to Barcelona. I don't know if that was for a holiday or if that was more work related. But what would you say is the one big thing that our community or the business community at large should be aware of right now mm-hmm. going forward? Well, going forward, I think it's understanding where the world is is going understanding they just sold recently didn't they? even though everybody talks about yeah, 
you know, microchips being in everything. One of my clients is <laughs> Army um, um, Holdings, which just, in as soon as well yeah, just better sold friends for 26 for. billion. <laughs> I, I can't wait to see what my cut is, to be honest. <laughs> um, they haven't been on the phone. <laughs> yes. Well, but I've been working with Arm Holdings over the years and with their board. So I've been very, very, very aware of the Internet of Things, sure. you know, how everything is going to be. I mean, even years ago, they were talking about, uh, you know, your fridge will, uh, will talk to um, your Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Tesco's and just automatically put an order in, to, uh, you know, to get it. Mm. And the world will change. And they say 50 percent of the jobs that exist today won't exist in 15 years' time. But that, for me, makes it all the more important that mm -hmm. people learn the communication skills that are always going to be important. People are still going to buy from people. Yep. People are still going to be influenced in their decision by people. And I find it very sad that schools do so little on communication skills. The guys we get on the mm -hmm. TV show, School of Hard Knocks, have been through 11 years school, sometimes more, and still don't know how to do a job interview. Still don't know the importance of eye contact, how to meet somebody, how to stand on stage, how to make a presentation. Any job, if you want to get on in any sphere, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you work for a company, whatever you do, yeah. having the ability to communicate as well as possible to everyone should be your baseline skill, but also will be the one thing mm -hmm. that will set you apart and stop, you know, the, the, in, the new revolution of technology taking your job away. Mm. If you can communicate well, you will always get a job, rise in a job, you know, help your, be, yourself become an entrepreneur. I work a lot with small entrepreneurs over the years mm -hmm. and, and they have to pitch themselves. Everybody is pitching themselves at all mm -hmm. times. So... Whatever happens in the world, the advice I would cool. I give to everyone, including my son, who happens to be very good at it, is learn how to stand Great up advice, in front Dan. of Thank people. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. And speak. So you it, know, I can see that you're very much you into paying it forward and passing knowledge on and training a people. What I'd like forward. to ask you next is, what great book or audio resource have you read that you would recommend to our listeners right now? Of course, of course. Your books will be featured on the show notes of this episode. Oh, well, uh, apart from my books, <laughs> I'm, jo I'm joking. There is, there's a book that I actually adore. It's a very short book, and it's written by a man called Victor E. Frankel, uh, spelled mm -hmm. F-R-A-N-K-L. And it's called Man's Search for Meaning. And it's, it's, it's a tribute to hope, really, from a man who survived the Holocaust. And it's an astonishing yeah. uh, story. Viktor Frankl was a psychologist uh, who went into a concentration camp in the Second World War. And he thought that he mm -hmm. would understand, as a psychologist, who would survive. And so mentally he would go, well, that guy who's really strong, he's going to survive. And it's just a book that everybody should read to understand what it really takes to survive and what are the important yeah. things that we need to know as human beings. It's, it's sort of a harrowing tale. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. It's not it's, a book that I've read. Um, I have well. heard it mentioned by a few people, that actually. Guides you so to understand I think it's definitely something what is important you know, we, need, we need to pay attention to. And it's going to go onto my Amazon wish list as well. So I am actually ordered four new books today. So I'm going to have yeah. to get a new one soon. I have as well. <laughs>
Thank you. Oh, Rob, over you to you. Disappointed. I promise you, Man's Search for Meaning is it's a very short book, but it's a, I think it's a life changing book when you read it. Yeah. Just one quick, just one quick question. I think this will be interesting because of, of, of Paul's repertoire. Paul, if you were going to invite any three people, any three people to a dinner party, mm -hmm. living or deceased, who would they be and why? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Any three people living or deceased. Uh, one yes. of them would be Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was lucky enough to meet Bill Clinton at uh, Soho mm -hmm. House. And I only spent two or three minutes chatting to yeah. him. But he has the most extraordinary charisma. Mm. And I just like to spend more time in his company to actually, as a psychologist, model what he's doing that is so amazing. Everybody I've ever mm -hmm. asked who's met Bill Clinton has said the same thing, that you kind of get enveloped by this extraordinary bubble of his charisma. And mm -hmm. I just, I actually think he's, uh, him and Obama are the greatest orators of the uh, <laughs> 21st century or the, even the 20th century. Right. I'd, I'd struggle not to get Barack Obama as well now I'm on that. Uh, <laughs> Two politicians, because, interesting. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering if I'm if it's going to be boring having two presidents there, living or dead. Let's go for somebody dead. Mm. I, I'd like, as a psychologist, to find out the psychology of somebody who, as evil and as wicked as Stalin. I'd just be <laughs> interested to see what motivates him. What what was actually going on in his head <laughs> and actually i think thank that's quite you, an interesting you, dinner you, party you, Barrett, 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 okay <laughs> so moving on from there and Stalin. <laughs> yeah that'll do me yeah, it'll exactly. keep me entertained but anyway, anyway. We, we do have a good question <laughs> paul what's thank the one thing in business or how you work that you can't live without <laughs> where do you go from that I suppose it's it's people, in particular my team who help me with my ta training programs, my books, my marketing, my publishers, Christopher Greenaway, who has been publishing my stuff for years. It's, he's just been such a rock and, and given me great advice over the years. In business, it's that, but I suppose it's also my family because... Yeah. When you go away, and you do go away doing a lot what I do, you know, I'm off to Beirut in a couple of weeks to, uh, to, to do stuff. I'm always all over Europe and America. And then, um, but it's actually having an understanding family who, who understand that it, you're not, when you're going off and you're talking in Cannes at a, a, a TV festival, mm -hmm. you're, you're not really on a jolly. And, yeah. and your family kind of understand that. And they have a wonderful way of bringing yeah. you back down to earth mm -hmm. and, and really sort of giving me that, that yeah. security that allows me to go off all over the world and, and do what I do. So it's not particularly things. I'm not really into things. But people are key in everything for me. Wonderful, wonderful. That's that. I like that thing. I like that thing about family. A good wife is 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 the cornerstone of everything, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> right. So thank you, um, Paul. I just want to thank you for taking time out to do this interview with us and the Elevation Nation. They, along with us, really appreciate it. And if somebody wishes to get in touch with you, what is the best way to contact you, Paul? Is it social well, media or a specific site? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, Paul at Paul Barros, P A U L B O R O W -S, S. I'm on LinkedIn if you want a business thing, or you can contact me directly awesome. through my website. Thank you for sharing that. And once again, as we get ready to wrap up, guys, I just want to say thank you for listening. And remember, Elevation Nation, it's through your support that we continue to grow and bring you more great guests just like Paul today. So please leave us a five star review on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, and we'll continue to elevate you. Rob, would you like to close out today? Okay. 
All right, then. Thank you. He's bestowed honors upon me at the end and at the beginning. So we're in for a treat. Paul, just want to say it's oh, been a pleasure. And just to close out, I, I want to say kind of generous. the meaning of your communication is the response you get. And I think above all else, what you'll find today, as Paul has mentioned, stand up in yeah. front of people expand your comfort zone and it will do amazing things for you i'm an advocate of it it's something that i will pass on to my children and i'm sure you guys can do the same whether it's your children friends or family or customers so once again paul thank you very much it's been a blessing yes thank you so pleasure. much I, uh, thank you paul Good luck, and I wish well to all the Elevation Nation. Appreciate it. Until next time, Elevation Nation, visit www.businessownerelevation.com and keep soaring to new and higher heights of productivity and profitability.